Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. I was looking at the historical file the other day, and I believe this is the 105th episode of Condo Insider, our show about trying to help owners and board members alike understand the law and the various opportunities and having a very successful association. We started last week with, uh, or I should say two weeks ago, we took a little short interlude to talk about Bill 69, which was front page news in the newspaper on fire sprinkler and the ability of an association to opt out. We started a kind of a general review of 514B, and I asked Nalan, prominent local attorney, a very, very good friend of mine, much smarter than me, um, to come back, and we're gonna kind of going through over the next three or four weeks, a review of 514B at kind of a overview level. So in the end, as always best, you check with your property manager or your attorney on some specific issues versus just taking uh, everything we say that applies exactly to the way you may think it apply. So welcome back. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk about 514B. And last week, we talked about the governing documents and basic governance issue. Mm -hmm. And we didn't quite finish on one thing. We were talking about where HRS 514B-154 mm -hmm. mandates documents to be provided to owners within 30 days. But the thing we didn't get really a chance to cover is whether that's a free ride for the owners or not. Because you know, I often, like this week, mm -hmm. got an email from an owner saying, I would like the last 20 years records and highlighted every single document that existed in the association's file. Mm -hmm. And they thought they could get that for free. Is that true? Can they get it for free? That's a misunderstanding. Yeah, so you will need to give them a written notice about the estimated cost for that. Then the owner can make a decision as to whether he wants to proceed ahead to do that. So, and when they do charge, what, what kind of things can they charge for? Uh, like a, an administrative handling, uh, you know, like copying, but there is a maximum, like a $1 per page, uh, that's like a ceiling charge amount. Uh, in addition to that, if you have a file stored at like a, um, you know, off-site storage space, uh, there may be additional charges to, like how to retrieve it back, transporting back then you may have to have another person, if they want to do the inspection, to uh, sort of, uh, you know, oversight, like a sit there, accompany them. I know there is a um, there is a free amount, like up to one year, it's like eight hours, I think, for all the owners in the project. If, you know, more than that, then someone has to pay for it, so. Well, I think that's a common misunderstanding because I think management companies and boards, they don't have objection to providing the documents people are entitled to by statute. Mm -hmm. But owners, maybe some of them slightly lazy, just take the statute and I want to see everything. And the problem is they don't realize that older records are stored in a warehouse, mm -hmm. and so they pay that warehouse for storage, and they have to pay someone to pull it out of the storage file, and they have to pay someone to truck it to the management company to be reviewed. So you put that box in a conference room, if there's potential litigation, you wouldn't want a person to be left unattended mm -hmm. because you wouldn't want them to be able to take or add to the file something that may have been there in the beginning. And then you throw on top of that, uh, uh, people may want copies and we're allowed to charge up to a dollar per page. So my suggestion has always been to owners to think through what you really want. Yeah. Versus just taking the easy way out and say, I want everything and because there's going to be a cost and most management companies will ask you to provide a deposit to cover the estimated costs and return any excess if there is any after the request is done. It's also more efficient for the owner. Just get what you want instead of you know getting a bunch of stuff you have to read through to find what you want. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that it says within 30 days. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a request this week on a Wednesday in the annual meeting of Saturday that they wanted to come into our office on Friday and review the last 10 years of records. Well, sadly, we had to say no, that mm -hmm. we would make an appointment for them, but again, we need to, have to identify the, the, the records again because of where they might be in storage, not in storage, you know, uh, there's got to be some reasonableness upon an owner's request because mm -hmm. we're not just sitting there all day waiting for someone to come in and, 
and see these records, which probably, if they're over a year old, aren't even in our office. Yeah, that's always the guideline. So anyway, we know in summary that there's a cost, and generally speaking, owners have to be, records have to be provided within 30 days. And we know the statute defines for the owner what they're entitled to, which means there's going to be many things that you'll probably be declined to receive. So let's go on to the purpose of today's show is to talk, I'm going to call it chapter or part two of 514B, which I'm going to call as financial fiscal matters. And let's talk about some basic things, some definitions. Sure. So define, we hear the word maintenance fees and we hear the word assessments. Mm -hmm. Kind of tell us what the real term is and, and what we're talking about. Uh, so basically, as you know, you are, if you are a member of the association, then you are uh, subject to a common assessment. It means the association can charge you a certain amount of fees in order to fund the association's general operation. It's generally according to the percentage of the common interest your unit uh, you know, uh, is subject to. Then uh, maintenance fee usually uh, refers to the regular monthly amount. That's a set amount, like uh, according to each year according to a budget, uh, then um, the assessment is a more broader term. It could mean like a special assessment, it could also mean like assessment of late fees, fines, or legal fees and costs. So if you talk about maintenance fees, sometimes uh, some association call it association dues, that's a narrow term, uh, just the regular monthly for the common assessment portion for the maintain maintaining the building. But on top of that, if your project has loans, there may be you know, some other charges which could in, fall into the category of general or special assessments. Yeah, my experience has been that we all use the word maintenance fees. We all know that maintenance fees includes more than maintenance. Mm -hmm. It'll have insurance, common water, or a bunch of additional charges, electricity for the common areas. And more commonly, under the statute, that's a regular assessment. Yes. And then you have other assessments, special assessment, maybe a, something surprise has happened, they need some additional cash, mm -hmm. or you might have an assessment because you violated the house rules, mm -hmm. and you might have late fees and other types of assessments as well. So how about reserves? What is reserves? A reserve uh, usually uh, sometimes also called like a re replacement reserves because some components of your building is going to have a shorter uh, lifespan. They will you know, wear out sooner you will have to come up uh, with money to try to um, get money ready to replace them sometime down the road. So you, you got to do like a, you know, like a the useful life remaining, like how many years projected you will need to replace them and how much money you need to put it in, something like that. Yeah, well, the reserve contribution, it's interesting, Ken. If you look at the administrative rules that support this statute, the quote, reserve contribution, the amount of money that every owner on a monthly basis either in their maintenance fee or as a separate line item as some association choose to do it, is really called estimated replacement reserves on the administrative rules, yes. where in the national standards it's called reserve contribution. Mm -hmm. It's really one and the same thing, but it's essentially the money that is paid by the owner and somewhat of a, quote, savings account for a future capital expense that is projected based on a reserve study. And so it's different because a lot of people don't understand that when an association does a budget, it's what I call a zero-based budget. You're collecting just enough money to pay the bills, estimated, mm -hmm. and just enough money to fund, based on a reserve study, your future capital expenses. And it may not be perfect. There may be times that electricity goes up or insurance goes up. Yes. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do because most boards run it pretty tight. They don't want to charge too much of maintenance fees, so they're ultra conservative in looking at those things. But since I mentioned the word budget, what is a budget? Uh, budget basically, it's like your own personal budget or family budget for association. In order for you to have enough money to operate, you have to sort of estimate, um, you know, for the next upcoming fiscal year, how much revenue do you have, how much expenses you will have, and then in order to fund the basic reserve, uh, then how much money you need to put aside, and then you sort of you know, calculate the numbers, and then um, you will calculate for each unit how much money you will need to assess for the next fiscal year. Does the board of directors have to do a budget? 
Oh yeah, that the annual budget is required by the statute. Yeah, and a lot of things that are not understood about the budget, if you read the statute carefully, it says the budget shall include a reserve study. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, when they do their annual budget, they have to uh, update their annual reserve study as a part of that budget process. It doesn't mean they go hire an expert. It may be, well, we said we're going to do the roof this year, but we didn't do it. We're going to do it next year, so we'll adjust our planning accordingly. Or yes, we did the roof. We budgeted 100000 but it really cost us 150000 mm -hmm. which means the amount of cash they had in reserves was probably depleted by 50000 more than they had budgeted, mm -hmm. and it affects their future contributions. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize that, yes, it's an annual requirement to do a budget, and the budget says, must include a reserve study. Mm -hmm. And so then that means you have to look at your reserve study every year and make sure that you made adjustments accordingly with respect to it. Yeah, because uh, you can't be really uh, too much off. Like other, if it's within 20% of a difference, that's okay. If you are overspending according to a budget, you will need to go to your members for approval, like a majority approval, or unless there's an emergency situation, of course, you know. And I wish my home budget worked that way, because my wife has a budget, <laughs> and she always tells me I'm over budget. I never know what the budget is. She doesn't tell me, but I don't know what it is. I'm always over budget at home, so I wish, I wish, I think condos work better than my home budget system does. So anyway, let's go, let's go back and make some more definitions uh, with respect to that. So you have to do a budget, but the law really says the components that have to be included in the budget. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what they are or what, what some of them are? Uh, you know, uh, there are, you know, uh, different items. If it's like a, the, the asset is over $10,000, you got to separate them. Each have a different one in the reserve study. And the rest of them, if it's lower than $10,000, you can actually aggregate them into one uh, item. That's usually how it works. Of course, you know, you think about it for a condo building, the most expensive items will be like a roof, elevator, you know, like you have parking lot resurfacing, you know, if you have AC system, you have replumbing stuff, then, you know, naturally you will know the expensive line items will be. And then, you know, before anyone buys into a condo, you definitely want to take a look at those financial documents. So with regard to the reserve study, it's interesting to point out that national standards define a reserve study as a budgeting tool. Mm -hmm. So again, the word budget surfaces. And a tool basically signals that this is not science. You're estimating mm -hmm. the cost, the useful life, how much of a remaining life there is, a whole bunch of variables which you really don't know if it's accurate or not. You're making a business judgment on trying to set up enough savings through the reserve contribution that you have enough money so when that expense comes due, realizing, again, it's a tool and actual circumstances as you go down the road may vary uh, from, the, uh, from the budget. Yes. And that's why the statute says, as long as you make a good efforts trying to calculate them right, it, they won't punish you or, you know, make you liable if the estimate turns out to be not correct. But the interesting, I've had, uh, you know, I sometimes, uh, those that may not know who are watching the show, I'm a, I'm a CAI reserve specialist. Um, I was integral in writing parts of the law back in 1997 when reserve study obligations were uh, put into effect, but I've also seen over the years national standards and the way reserve study thinking has changed because we've become more knowledgeable in this new field. You know, a lot of the thinking has changed with regard to how to do a reserve study, but what I've seen from the expert witness work I've done, the key is a good faith effort. Yes. And I've had clients say to me, well, you know, we have a great reserve study if we just pretend the central air conditioning doesn't exist. So if we take the central air conditioning out of the reserve study and just pretend it's not there, mm. we have a perfectly funded reserve study. Do you think that passes the good faith test? I think probably not. <laughs> That's an intentional, you know, you, you already know it's out there. You're trying to pretend as if that that's a pretty much a you know, a red flag that, you know, it's not a good fit. And before we take the break, I'll just make one more comment about reserves. 
My experience is when you get professional help to guide you, mm -hmm. still a board decision, mm -hmm. you will find that if you have deferred maintenance or big items coming up down the road like the common wastewater pipe we see today, by having a person who understands how this is calculated and with the things you can do to help mitigate uh, the problem, it'll have a, the least impact on your, your maintenance fees. You'll still do a right job and a proper job, but if you as a novice try to do some of this, you're going to make some fundamental mistakes and uh, probably cost a lot more money. And in Richard's little note about that, we're going to take a little one-minute break. We'll be right back talking about more fiscal matters on associations. Welcome, welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery, your host. And what I'd like to do is tell you where we are. We're talking about 514B. It's going to be a multi-series show just reviewing the basics. And we're talking with Nalan, association lawyer, about the legal requirements with regard to the fiscal side, budgets, financial statements, those types of issues. And we were just finishing up on talking about a reserve study and what the issues are there. So, do you have any feelings about, you know, we have under the current law on reserves, I hear this everywhere I go, 50% funded or fully funded balances. Mm -hmm. And I tell everybody when I give my talks, if I could give you an enema of the mind so you never heard the word percent funded ever again, I would have you take an enema of the mind. Do you have any feelings about percent funded versus cash flow? Or? Uh, that's really some language from the statute. It's pretty confusing for people not familiar with this. Uh, you know, there are actually different methods of funding your reserve. Uh, you know, one way is the component uh, or the street line method. The other one is the uh, cash flow or the call pooling. So basically, for a component, you would pick out each uh, you know component that needs you know you to save money for a replacement. You you do that according to like a, um, for the fiscal year, you do that, and then the statute requires you uh, the minimum percent you have to fund it. That's fifty percent. If you're doing the cash flow, then it's really you're like pulling uh, all of the stuff. You project it over like a for minimum twenty years. You know how much it will take you to be fully funded. Uh, you know in within 20 years. So really it's two different methods and it could give you some really different numbers depending on the project. Yeah. Let me give you some historical background on that because yes. I happen to know a lot about this. Of course, you're the expert. You know this, when the state decided that they wanted to have some reserve re contribution requirement, primarily because it's believed that developers were underestimating that amount of money and mm -hmm. the maintenance fees were artificially low, they passed a law providing for what we call component method, mm -hmm. percent funded, and because they're afraid that would put too much burden on the owners, they said, well, you only have to be 50% funded by January 1, 2000. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that that method is used probably by less than 1% of the associations in the United States. Everybody uses, it's like cash and accrual accounting. Mm -hmm. The ways you do this are very different. Mm -hmm. The pooling method, or the, where you pool the money and look at this as bundles of money needed in a given year versus by single component what's needed, um, 
is what everybody else uses because it gives you more level and the historically accurate balances to project that. So um, that's why I said I wish people could take an enema of the mind because they get confused. Because think about it this way. If, if you did percent funded, it changes every year because it's a single year plan. Yes. What message are you sending to people, I'm 50% funded? You're underfunded. Uh, yeah, you're 50% short is what the <laughs> message is. Right. Where you can take that same data mm -hmm. and put it into a 20-year cash flow, which looks at this as a pool of money. Right. And see, you're fully funded. You have balances every year. You're collecting enough money. So you have to be very careful to understand the differences. But I think most people would say that we use a 20-year cash flow or a pooling method. They, they call it the cash flow method in simple terms. But it's the funding method for what they're looking at. But I don't recommend the percent funded, you know. Uh, yeah, so it, actually my understanding is it's like n not every component is going to fail at the same time, right? There's right. always probably like the some may be lasting longer than the useful life, some may be like even shorter. So you pulling them together, it will make more sense instead of you do it like each item. Right, and if you look at just projections and mm -hmm. what happens in the real world, mm -hmm. you have all these projections for 100 components. They're all going to be off a little bit higher, low, shorter or longer in life yes. or whatever it may be. So you want to take the best economic advantage and say, well, if in fact the roof costs a little more, you're in theory borrowing money from another component. Right. When cash flow, you're just using your pool of money to your best advantage. Yes. Under cash flow, you're borrowing money for another component, which puts a demand on to get more money and also gives you a lower percentage funded. So it can be very confusing to people. And I think, so. and I think that we've tried for uh, 1997 is when they, uh, they added the cash flow method as a legal method to, uh, to do that, because I wrote that language. And, um, uh, it's probably the still greatly misunderstood in the industry, and uh, but we want people to realize that uh, again, you want to look at what best opportunities you have to do the budget to make sure the reserves are done. So let's just say I don't fund the reserves. Let's just say mm -hmm. I'm short. Mm -hmm. Am I as a board member liable for that? Oh yeah, I think uh, you do have a fiduciary duty as a board director. If the owners, after they review that, they think that a reasonable board director, you know, by making business judgment, should have done that, then they definitely have a cause of action against you. And we've actually saw losses before filed in arbitration, and owners won a big, you know, arbitration award against the board, against the association. Yeah, I don't think board members personally are liable unless there's yeah. some really nefarious thing that went along that mm -hmm. uh, would be the exception under rule. And certainly under the statute, owners can force the board to do a proper reserve study. Yes. In a sense, they can force that. And I've seen lawsuits and arguments both ways that have gone both ways when owners have uh, filed a suit against the association about not properly implementing a reserve study. And in a binding arbitration, I saw a ward where the arbitrator maintained control and put standards on when the association had to complete these uh, corrections to the capital components as a part of the arbitration award. But I've never seen an award against a board member individually for uh, saying, well, you didn't do the reserve study properly, so the fact we're short now to put a new roof on, yeah. you're personally liable for it. I mean, it's more like an injunctive relief, because the goal is really you have to you know, make sure the association has the correct reserve down there, and maybe the owner would get some recovery for legal fees and costs uh, you know, he or she incurs in order to enforce that. I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier that about good faith, mm -hmm. because the basic law says if, if, if you've done good faith, uh, you don't have a personal liability. Yes. And so if, in fact, in my example, where they deleted the air conditioning system, and now there's a special assessment that owner wasn't counting on you intentionally deceive the buyer or the owner of the mm -hmm. circumstances, there could be some potential liability because you fail the good, theoretically, you fail the good faith argument. Definitely, I see the exposure to personal liability there, yeah. Well, I've been involved in a lot of litigation on reserves from different perspectives, and, and I think I ought to do a whole show about that sometime. There's some learning curve out of the case study with regard to the reserves. I think it is important to emphasize what you said earlier, and that is that you have to identify all the components 
of a value of greater than $1,000. If they're greater than 10,000, you have to have a separate line item on the reserve study. Right. If they're less than 10,000, let's say pool equipment, the pump, the filter, you can call it pool equipment and bundle together those items less than 10,000 and greater than 1,000 to a, a, a common uh, uh, situation. A good example would be doors. If the doors are a common element of the apartment, the individual door is over a thousand but less than ten thousand. You could call it apartment doors mm -hmm. of a hundred thousand and filter it in either in stages or phases or the lump sum based on your circumstances. So my point on the reserves is it's a it's a real obligation of the board to do a conscientious job. Those that do will have less problems down the road, and those that think they have larger issues, maybe you ought to look, just like we always advise business judgment, get experts, someone who might be qualified and skilled to help them. But I'd like to take a minute and go back, we have a couple minutes left. Sure. I'd like to take, take a minute and just go back to the budget requirements, mm -hmm. and because there are certain statutory obligations that have to be in the budget. Yes, um, like for example, um, how much the expenses are, the revenues uh, estimate, I get what kind of, uh, are you going to use cash basis or accrual basis of accounting, and then um, like the total in your reserve account, how much contribution will be needed to fund it, and um, like also uh, what uh, method of funding you're, you're going to be using. Um, there are definitely those requirements. And it's ironic to me. I've done a lot of budgets, and I can't speak for everybody and even our company. Uh, I can say in general terms, mm -hmm. when I used to do budgets, I had a standard disclosure page. And all the things the statute said you had to do, I had in a summary page at the top. This budget was prepared on the accrual basis of accounting. The initial reserve balance starting the fiscal year is $1 million. Mm -hmm. The amount of money our reserve study says we should collect is $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And the statute goes on to say you have to disclose whether or not you're collecting that. The board of directors budget collects $100,000 a year. And the easiest way to protect yourself is to know what the disclosures are and have a cover page. Yes. You know, because a lot of people, frankly, I'd say, Generally speaking, in the industry, not very many people do that. And it's a really good check and balance if you do those disclosures and you look and say, what did I just say? Is this something we should do? Now, real quick, because we're down to about a minute. Mm -hmm. Can people withhold assessments if they don't like the budget or the plan? No, they cannot. You have the statutory obligation to pay your assessment. And if you don't pay your assessment? Uh, you know, associations have the power to, you know, um, impose late charges if the, the board has adopted a policy, or they can also put liens on your property if you're delinquent on assessments. Of course, they also have the power to foreclose on the statutory lien. Well, I think that would tell owners they should be very careful and not paying because yeah. we'll discuss, we've discussed on a show a couple of weeks ago, what priority of payment is. But boards need to understand, or homeowners need to understand that it's a zero-based budget. We're depending on everybody to pay what's owed so we can pay our bills. If someone doesn't pay, we're short money. Mm -hmm. And it's either going to affect the reserves, your ability to pay your operating expenses. So this is why we have a pay first, dispute later provision. Although we'll discuss in another show coming up, the bill that just passed out of the conference committee, 1873, which gives some short-term minor relief if the outstanding balance is only a fine. But on that note, there's never enough time to discuss all of this. I want to thank Nalan again for coming. A pleasure. You know, and I'm going to get you back for the next part of 514B. We hope you enjoy our show and you're finding it educational and informative. Feel free to email us at any time if you have a specific question. And thank you for watching Condo Insider.